Welcome to the Hope for the Animals podcast. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and if you're new to the podcast, welcome. You can listen to past episodes and get caught up at our website, hopefortheanimalspodcast.org, and you can find my contact information there as well. So today we have a wonderful guest, Gwenna Hunter from Vegans for Black Lives Matter is joining us for a really fantastic interview, and we're going to jump into that soon. But first, I wanted to give a recommendation for another podcast. I love podcasts, of course, obviously, (laughs) since I created one, but there are so many other good ones out there, and there is one that I wanted to tell you about. It's new, and it's called Plant-Based Briefings. It's hosted by Marian Erickson, and she's a voiceover artist, and she had the idea to read an article a day written by activists and authors in animal rights and vegan advocacy. So they're short episodes, just about 10 minutes each, but there's a new one every day, and she is reading actually some of my articles, some of my writings, as well as articles written by Karen Davis of UPC. And she just read one of mine on June 4th, and I'm so honored that she is reading my writings on her podcast, as well as Karen's and so many other amazing activists. So again, it's plant-based briefings, and you can subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. They're great if you have just a little bit of time to kill. You can listen to one while waiting for a meeting or waiting for dinner to cook or whatever. It's great that they're just about 10 minutes. They're short, and but they're really informative on a wide array of topics related to veganism. I will put a link in the show notes so you can go and check that out, Plant-Based Briefings Podcast. And then just a follow-up. So on the last episode with Justin Van Cleek, I said a phrase straight from the horse's mouth, talking about Justin's expertise. And immediately I wondered out loud on the podcast if it was speciesist language. And Justin and I kind of pondered it for a moment. It doesn't sound like it would be negative, not blatantly negative, like some, like most common phrases around animals, a lot of common phrases around animals, but we have our answer. So thanks to a listener who wrote in that phrase straight from the horse's mouth actually originated from horse racing. So what the history is, is that the stable boys who cared for the horses were closest to the horses and 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 like knew them the best and they knew which horses were in good shape and good health and would run the best or fastest or whatever I guess and so if you got some insider information from the stable boy it was seen as being as good as getting it from the horse's mouth So, of course, why am I not shocked that this phrase comes from a practice that exploits and hurts animals? So there was an interesting discussion on another podcast, yet another podcast that I love, The Bearded Vegans. They recently had an episode about speciesist language, and they pondered terms like this that had animal exploitive origins but that that is now lost. And it's not known that the term or the phrase or the word comes from something around exploiting animals. And it's not clear, right? Is it worth changing that language? And that was kind of the question that they were raising. And, you know, I mean, with some phrases, it is absolutely clear that it's about harming animals. And of course, we should change that and not say those those uh, phrases or words. But with others, it's not as clear. And the example they gave was the incredibly common word, branding, like marketing and branding, like you brand a product, your brand and logo and marketing. So I hadn't really ever thought about it, but this word comes from, of course, and now you're probably putting it together, branding some image or letters into the skin of an animal or human, 
with a hot iron, which of course is incredibly painful and cruel. But that's not at all what people now think when we're thinking about branding a product, right? It's so crazy how language can just evolve and change. You know, but is it worth changing a word or term or trying to out that word or term if that cruel meaning is lost and not what someone thinks about now? I don't know. It's something to ponder. We have to pick our battles. But there is so much language that is blatantly related to doing animals harm. It seems that we should focus on changing those terms first, of course. And also not necessarily physical harm, but having respect for animals, like using he, she, or they, and not referring to animals as it, things like that. So I think these are more important to focus on. But having the knowledge around even obscure terms, it's still important. Fascinating stuff. I'm considering doing a a larger rant on it in a future podcast, so let me know if you have any thoughts around language. Okay, so let's bring in our guest now. Gwenna was such a delight to interview. We had so much fun, and I learned a lot and got to think about things from a different perspective that I hadn't before, and it just it reminded me of how important this podcast is to me. I learn so much. I think about things differently after these amazing conversations. So I hope that all of you are getting just as much out of this podcast as I am. And I also want to mention that there are some words in this episode that might be triggering for some, so just please be aware of that. Okay, let's go to the interview now. Okay, we are so blessed today to be joined by Gwenna Hunter. Gwenna is the creator of Vegans of L.A., and Vegans for Black Lives Matter. She's also part of the Animal Save Movement and functions as the Health Save Movement's campaigner. Gwenna also manages several vegan food aid programs at Vegan Outreach, and they provide local community and nutrition support for organizations like Black Women for Wellness, Black Lives Matter LA, Black Women Farmers of LA, and the LGBT Center South. So we are really, really happy to have her. Welcome to the podcast, Gwenna. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, I would love to start by hearing a bit about your journey. What is your superhero origin story? You are certainly a superhero in your community of LA, (laughs) uh, doing so much there. So let's hear about why you went vegan, when you went vegan, what got you into all this activism? What is your origin story? So the journey actually started in uh, 2008. Um, I was having, well, I had already suffered from like some digestion issues where my body would no longer uh, support me eating cows. And that was like years prior And fast forward to 2008, a friend of mine wanted to go on something called a Daniel's fast together, which is uh, based out of the Bible. And basically you're vegan, but it's done usually to like help manifest or get your life clearer and just like, just have a higher frequency. Hmm. And so I decided to do it. It was a 28 day challenge, had nothing to do with health or animals. It was just about me manifesting. And at the end of the 28 days, I had lost weight. I felt absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, I used to have very severe um, menstrual cycles. It came and left in like a couple of days. I didn't feel a thing. I was pleasant. I didn't have any breakouts. I was like, what? And so because my cycles usually controlled my life, it was like a huge breakthrough for me that, wow, I can actually function normally as a person if I stick to this lifestyle. So I ended up not sticking to the lifestyle, but I became vegetarian slash pescatarian. Hmm. And um, I found that it did help a little bit. Fast forward to 2016, and I end up having a dream and if you hear a bunch of squeaking, there's, there's a lot of birds that just came over to the porch. So <laughs> it's a little that's okay. Bird, birds are welcome. That's fine. 
there's a symphony going on right now. <laughs> so what happened was I'm in the dream. I was flying as we do in dreams and I was high in the sky and I saw this really beautiful, bright green pasture. And then I saw a cow and the cow, she looked up at me. And when she looked at me, our eyes connected and locked. And then we merged and I became one with her and I was her. And I saw like her whole life, like was like in me. And mm-hmm. I saw love, I saw suffering, I saw joy. I saw the love for her children. I saw mating. I saw the love they have for, for humans. I felt all of her emotions. I felt everything, like I was the cow. And I'm not sure how long it lasted. I don't know if it was seconds or minutes, but when I woke up from the dream, I was hysterical and I was crying because I'm like, oh my God, cows love. And it had never, and I've always been like a spiritual seeker, always on the, the quest for the truth and never did the, did I have an inkling or even have a conversation or thought about if a cow or any other type of animals that we consume have the capacity to love. And I'm like, oh my God, they love and they love deep and their their hearts are so pure and we're eating their bodies. And so even though I was vegetarian and I wasn't eating cows, I didn't care if anyone else did. So you could totally have a steak like in front of me. It, It didn't bother me one bit. But after this dream, I was just like, wow. And so as I'm sitting there crying, I'm like, okay, did I eat something weird? Like, did that just really happen? (laughs) And then all of a sudden, while I'm wide awake, I'm not in a dream anymore. I feel this warmth, really tremendous warmth um, right above my chest. And I look and I don't see anything. And I put my hand there. And all of a sudden, I was paralyzed with the most beautiful peace I had ever felt. Like it was just tranquility and peace. Like I felt like I could have just like died and, and stayed in it. Like I would have just left earth for this feeling to last. And I knew then that the experience was real and that, you know, maybe the cow gave me a piece of her heart or, or something to let me know this wasn't just, you know, you ate something weird last night. Like this is a message. And so it just, it blew my entire reality to pieces because I'm like, I've been eating these individuals and they have these type of feelings and emotions. And it was a little, a little bit of shame. Well, actually a lot of shame. And just the fact that I didn't get it until then. And to be honest with you, I still didn't even have a full understanding until about maybe two weeks later, I came across the video, which obviously wasn't a coincidence, Um, by Aaron Janice called Dairy is Effing Scary. And then I saw in the video what we do to them to get their milk and what we do to their children when they give birth and they're pregnant for nine months like a woman. And so when I saw that video, I'm like, I like, it was clear to me that was, it was slavery. It was rape. uh, It was torture. uh, It was kidnapping and it was murder. And I saw it as as like there was nothing cloudy about what I saw. And I was like hardcore moral vegan from that moment on. I won't say hardcore, but I was for about maybe three or four months, one of those vegans that was just like sharing all these slaughter videos saying, we got to go vegan. What are you doing? (laughs) So I was a crazy vegan for about four months Mm -hmm. (laughs) until I realized that that approach wasn't winning any hearts. And <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I had to tailor it down a little bit and uh, <laughs> create some balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that, that certainly happens to most of us. I think when we first go vegan, there's this a, a beautiful awakening in, within us. And we just want everyone to experience that. We want everyone to feel, you know, what we're feeling, but what an amazing experience that you had. I'm just, I, I, I almost, I was tearing up. I almost cried hearing about your vision and your connection with that cow and wow. I was just so beautiful. And, you know, as a spiritual person myself, I'm, you know, kind of jealous that you had such an amazing experience in a way, but wow, that was just incredible. And I, and I do want to talk more about 
your spiritual connections and relationships and, and how you are uh, experiencing a spiritual life today. But I'd love to start, though, with your activism and hear about the organizations that you've started. So you've started Vegans of LA and Vegans for Black Lives Matter. So tell our listeners about these two organizations and why you started them, why you saw a need for them. And uh, yeah, we'd lo- I'd love to hear about them. Yeah, so Vegans of LA honestly was started while I was still a vegetarian. Um, I just didn't think Vegetarians of LA had a good ring to it. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, that's kind of a long name and vegans you know, people probably want to hang out with vegans more than they do vegetarians. So, so I was like, okay, vegans of LA it is, but I was not a vegan. Um, what's, what happened was I started doing meetups just to meet people because I was somewhat still new to Los Angeles. And the meetups were, I was, you know, having a decent amount of people come out to them. And so in order to promote my meetups more, um, I decided to create a Facebook page and when I created the Facebook page, I started posting like articles and different things and the page started growing. And I'm like, oh, I think I got a little, little community, a little something here. And so that's kind of how that started. But yeah, I wasn't vegan for probably at least six months. And then vegans for Black Lives Matter, this was literally, and it, it's still unfolding. It was, it, it was not me. It was something divine. Mm -hmm. I was literally standing in the kitchen and all of a sudden, like I was minding my business and I literally got like a download, like a mental download. And I heard vegans for black lives matter, create the group. And I'm like, oh, that sounds genius. Cause it was literally right off the the details of George Floyd. Mm. So it just happened like right after George Floyd. And so I'm thinking, you know, maybe we'll get 75 people because based on my experience you know in the vegan community unfortunately I just didn't feel like there would be enough support um so I created the group and it's interesting because I really don't like uh having groups I've had them in the past and it just takes a lot of energy and a lot of you have to be able to hold space for people you have to create content get people motivated to come in the group invite people like it's just a lot of time and energy that I just did not have and so I created the group And um, I invited about probably about 10 friends and I'm like, oh, I'll check in with them next week and we'll work on creating this group together. So I was just going to create the group and, you know, leave it alone for a week or two. And the next morning um, I saw these notifications. There's like 500 freaking people in the group. And I'm like, what? Wow. (laughs) And then like every day it kept growing. And then I had to put some rules on it, some really strict ones to stop it from growing so much because there was so much chaos and so much pain on both sides. There were so many white people that were expressing how sad and guilty they felt for not knowing about police brutality or not paying attention. There were so many black people that came in with their rage and, and wanted to just express it. So there was a lot of anger and I'm very empathic. So I was absorbing all of that energy from what I was reading and it was, it made me sick one time. Oh, and so I had to realize I had to create boundaries and not take on the responsibility of feeling like I needed to heal everybody and do all this work. Um, what I think the purpose of the group is, is for people to have a safe space to hurt and to share their pain and to come in and learn without being judged. I mean, I'm not going to say it's a safe space um, because arguments happen. People get, you know, say things that are offensive or people get sensitive. So things do occur, but it is a place for the most part where people can come in and learn. Uh, You don't have to necessarily participate and post, but you can come in and read and, and see what's going on. So I think that's the reason that I was chosen to create this space for people. Well, I love that you were just a vegetarian when you started Vegans of LA. <laughs> That's great. It just shows, you know, I think there's in the vegan community, sometimes we we get very adversarial with vegetarians yes. and, you know, even more so than meat eaters sometimes because we feel like, well, you're halfway there. You, you know, you understand you need to be there all the way. 
but it just shows how, you know, people are on their journey. We need to be accepting and, uh, you know, respectful, but of course, educating and, and also always helping people to, to move along their journey. But I love that, that you were just vegetarian when you started a vegan group. It shows that we need to be accepting and open to everyone and where they are on their journey because people want to move further. They want to do better. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that was great. So where do these groups live, you know, in cyber world where, where, when you're, when you say that they're connecting and posting, is this Facebook? Is it uh, a website? What, where do you find Vegans of LA and Vegans for Black Lives Matter? Um, so Vegans of LA is on Facebook and also on Instagram under Vegans of LA and also under Vegans of Los Angeles. I just claimed the extra name. So no one would take it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But on, on Instagram, it's Vegans of LA and Vegans of Los Angeles underscore. For Vegans for Black Lives Matter, it's also on Instagram, but the group is actually on Facebook. So it's a private group, but you can search for it and find it under Vegans for Black Lives Matter. You just have to answer the questions. And if you answer them um, and we check your, we do everything. We check people's profiles to see what they've posted, because as you know, people will sometimes come into the group with opposing views and just try to stir up yeah. a little bit of controversy. So we're very, very selective on who we let into the group. But as of right now, we have about 4,800 members. Wow. And covering around 4,800. But if I didn't have those rules, it would definitely be over probably about 25,000 because it was growing so much every day. Wow. And so we had to just kind of cut it because I'm like, I can't. So it's one thing when you have a group and it's about recipes and <laughs> how I've been vegan, but this is like, you know, it can be depressing, mm -hmm. you know, especially when there's a trial going on or a verdict or a police brutality issue that's just happened. So there's a lot of darkness sometimes associated with the group. So it's not all bright, bubbly and fun. So I have to like make sure that we just have the right amount of people in there and the right people inside because it, it takes a lot of energy and emotions to make sure that people are in there and they're safe and we're not bringing each other down because that can happen sometimes too. Yeah. I, moderating Facebook pages. I, I, I know because I have to moderate a few myself and it's, it is certainly time consuming and there's comments and everything, but, but, but this kind of takes it to a, another level that you have to be very careful that, you know, no, one, no one's harming anyone else or no one's hurting or saying things that would be hurtful. So yeah, I could see where that yeah. would be like a constant, constant moderation. <laughs> Yeah, and I have to moderate myself when there's the trial what's going on. You know, sometimes we start to post, you know, all brutality articles and, and sad things. And I caught myself getting, I saw myself getting caught up and I'm like, oh, stop. Like, you know, for a moment, for a week, we were, everybody was just like posting, you know, horrible things. And then we had to like switch the energy up mm. because it's like, it can be overwhelming. And, you know, those type of things can cause depression. So yeah. we have to be very careful that we're not harming each other. And I have to, like I said, monitor myself as well. Yeah. I think it's wonderful that you started these groups. Uh, it's so needed and so important. And, and on this note, I have heard that Black people are the fastest growing segment of vegans. And I wanted to ask you about that and see if, if that's true and if you've heard anything about that. Well, it's, it's amazing because I'll say this first. When I first became vegan and I had the Vegans of LA page, it was mostly like 90% white and female. I didn't know the language. I didn't know what speciesism was. I was still calling animals it and you know things like that and so I had like a huge learning curve and um, I found myself like sometimes being too intimidated to even like express myself because I'm like oh my god I'm gonna get eaten up if I you know <laughs> say the wrong things yeah. and um, I just didn't know hardly any black vegans like any and one day I posted a trailer by Jasmine Lavia for the the movie Invisible Vegan. It's about vegan, you know, black vegans. Yes, we, I've and, had her, we've had her on the podcast. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's my buddy. Yeah. And so 
I posted the video and I had like 1500 followers on the vegans of Olay page. The next day I had 8,000 and most of them were all black. I'm like, yes, this is where y'all at. (laughs) So, (laughs) and so it, I was like, oh, I think I found my audience. And so I went on YouTube and started looking up black vegans and I was in shock at how many were on there doing cooking demonstrations and how many were even, you know, there were even some talking about the animals. And I'm like, what? Y'all talking about the animals? Yes. And so it was just like amazing. And so now it's, it's so strange. Even if I just organically run into people that are black, that I don't know, most of the time, like they're vegan or they're on the journey or they understand the conversation and they're thinking about it. Mm. And what's beautiful, I'm seeing so many new black vegan content creators that are making music videos that are, you know, showing different types of cuisine to cook. Like one uh, young lady, Voodoo Vegan, she specializes in New Orleans style vegan food and she veganizes crab cakes and uh, etouffee and all types of different things. And so it's just beautiful. And when I talk to these people, they're like, oh yeah, I just went vegan six months ago. So they're coming in fired up and ready to change the world. And what's even more beautiful is I'm meeting so many black vegans that care about the planet. They care about the animals. So that was the thing I noticed in the beginning. I didn't see a lot of, it was still like, oh, y'all love animals more than you love people. Like I would hear, you know, people that were, I would say, I would say plant-based that were talking like this, but now people are stepping it up and they're like, yes, you know, these animals, you know, we we can't hurt them and we got to stop eating them. And I just, it, I love when I see my black vegan community care about the animals and care about the planet. Like there's nothing greater. So, because it's like, you know what, you can do both. You can care about people and the animals. You don't have to choose. So I think are actually getting that it's not a a choice or one or the other you can actually do both and I will say since becoming vegan like my heart has opened so much I didn't even think like sometimes it's almost too overwhelming to where it's like oh my god I care about the whole world turn this off you know it's like too much (laughs) but um (laughs) yeah yeah so I it I love hearing all that. That makes me so happy. And I feel really, really uh, excited for the future of veganism that so many other communities and uh, cultures and, and, you know, they're, they're, it's just growing so much. And I love that. And I think sometimes as animal activists, we have a bit of resistance that we have to focus on the animals only, you know, it's uh, animals only animals are the most important, that kind of thing. And I get that to a point because being an activist can be very overwhelming. It can be, you know, it takes a ton of your energy. And if you've gotten, if, if, if your focus is vegan activism, then, you know, you kind of are like, ah, that's all I can handle. I can't do a hundred other causes, you know, but I think that people need to realize that that's, that's not what's being asked. We certainly don't want people to be spread too thin, uh, but including, you know, anti-oppression work into our vegan activism just by using language that's more inclusive, having our campaigns be more diverse, that, you know, bringing in diverse communities, that is going to strengthen our activism. It's going to strengthen uh, veganism and it's going to help animals in the long run. I agree. I totally agree. And it also creates, I don't know the right word, but when you include anti-oppression in your work, other groups and communities feel more like they can trust you and listen to what you have to say. Yeah. You know, I work with Black Lives Matter and they know that the organization I'm with is about anti-oppression. So it makes them feel a little safer to trust us and and work together with us rather than it just being just strictly a mono message. So it's very important that we do that. And that's how you're going to change the entire world. Yeah. You can't change the whole system with just one. There's, there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I've heard 
some activists say, and I totally agree, that we don't just want a vegan world where everybody's eating veggie burgers, but there's still horrible oppression of yeah. human communities and and you know and the planet's still being destroyed and all of that. No, that's that's you know, when we say we want a vegan world, I think we are including compassion for everyone and justice for everyone, humans included. Uh, so we have right. to, yeah. We already have a problem with food deserts and some communities not having access to fresh fruits and vegetables, but now the pandemic has really caused even more food insecurity. What can we do to combat this? I know you work with a few vegan aid programs or vegan food aid programs. Tell us about that work. So with vegan outreach, we had to do a, a strong pivot when the pandemic occurred, because our work was mostly in going to different events or conventions, colleges, and setting up tables and giving out samples and having people sign up for our programs. But obviously that was no longer going to be allowed. So someone came up with the idea of providing food because, you know, there were in the beginning, there was a lot of like shortages because everyone was like panicking. I was one of them, not going to even lie, but uh, <laughs> yeah, my, my, my husband started a, a, we call it the pandemic garden because oh, so wow. <laughs> pandemic panic garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I still have toilet paper left. Not even going to lie to oh, you. No. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so anyway, what we started to do, so I manage Los Angeles. We have uh, Vic Flores who manages uh, New Mexico. We have people in Northern California. We have people in Iowa. So all of our different locations, we were given like a budget and we chose certain communities to work with and decided we would provide them with like groceries. Um, mostly with like a lot of like fresh produce and some plant-based products and a hot plant-based meal. And so it just, it just blossomed. And so now it's not even about the pandemic. It's about providing nutritional support because all of our communities are in areas that it's not necessarily like total desert, but there's not a lot of like organic or fresh or different types of options. So you know, there's grocery stores I've gone to, they don't even have organic strawberries. Like mm -hmm. it's not even a thing. They just have conventional strawberries or, you know, there's just not an organic section, just the conventional section. And so we wanted to be able to do this without any type of like forced reciprocation to where, oh, you have to listen to me talk or you have to sign up for this. It was something being done unconditional. And uh, we work with different vendors uh, to come out and provide the hot meals, which is great because during the pandemic, we were able to, you know, hire a lot of vendors that were, you know, struggling. And so being able to use your money consciously and also to feed your communities, I mean, it's been the best work I've ever done, I would say, in my life. Like, it's, it's so incredibly rewarding. Um, here in Los Angeles, uh, I work with Black Women for Wellness which is a great nonprofit organization. They're about the preservation of, of Black health, even though they're open to everyone, but they do focus on um, maternal health, mental health, all types of things, and, and obviously nutrition. I also work with Black Lives Matter. Uh, once a month at their general meeting, we will provide them with like food boxes, uh, with plant-based items and fresh fruits and vegetables and also have their meeting catered with a plant-based meal. Also work with another organization called Black Women Farmers of Los Angeles. They started last year and they have like a garden. Hearing this, uh, the the name of this group, I was, I was kind of surprised because I didn't even know there were farmers in LA, much less Black women farmers in LA. Yeah. So that's, that's wonderful to hear. I Tell us about this group. Yeah. So they have like several large plots. It's called Vanguard Community Gardens. It's next next to a school. It's part of a school, actually. The founder, her name is uh, Amachina, and she grows all types of vegetables. So like this summer, like last summer, I remember she called me. She's like, I have a surplus of cucumbers. Come and get some of these cucumbers. And they're... <laughs> 
so many freaking cucumbers. Um, <laughs> she grows cantaloupe, seeded watermelon, cilantro, tomatoes, beets. I mean, every parsley, every peppers, everything that you can think of, she grows it. Big, beautiful cabbages. You know, it's about creating food sovereignty where you don't have to rely on the food system yeah. to supply your food because God forbid anything ever happens and there's ever some type of collapse and there's some type of temporary reset and people don't have access to supermarkets, it's going to be full chaos. So it's really smart that we all start learning how to grow our own food in some type of capacity. Yeah. And then lastly, we just picked up, uh, we've for about a month now, we've been working with the LGBT Center South and uh, they're absolutely, it's probably, I won't even lie, it's like my favorite one because they're so much fun and uh, they're just, it's just a really great group of, of people. And like we play music and it's just a good time. And so we provide them same capacity, hot food, produce and uh, plant-based products. Last week, well, the week before last, we provided like uh, Gardein chicken tenders Uh, for their bags, because we want people to be able to try these products, because most people still have a stigma of of what veganism is. I know back in the day, in the 90s, when I tried it, it was horrible. (laughs) I had like a veggie burger, and I couldn't even do it. Hmm. I'm like, what is this? And so, um, you know, we want to take that myth away from people that, you know, the food is, is terrible. We want people to know like this food, the food technology, the way it's evolving is absolutely amazing. So what can the white vegan community do better when it comes to anti-oppression work in in the animal rights movement? Well, I will say one of the things that was really saddening recently, and I was shocked to see quite a few vegans, because here's the thing, when you, this is what I thought when I first became vegan, I thought it was like a community full of like spiritual conscious hippies that were just like, (laughs) loving the whole world and that had a certain level of awakening Mm. because I'm like if you love animals then you obviously you know love humans and so but we both know that's not the case (laughs) when it comes to a lot of vegans don't like people and oftentimes that is celebrated and I do have a huge issue with that because as a black person if I hear a white person say they hate humans that's scary to me. It, mm. it, it, it makes me fearful of that person and definitely not someone that I um, want to help save the world with. It, it, you, you can't, you know, I mean, you can do whatever you want. I do understand because there's times where I'm like, what kind of planet is this? How did I land here <laughs> of all the planets? <laughs> but I do get the disappointment in our, in our own species. So I totally do somewhat understand But that's just not something we should be celebrating and promoting because it scares other vegans away, especially if you're a person of color. So we really have to watch that language. Also, when it comes to anti-oppression, one thing that I had noticed, like a lot of people were making excuses for police brutality by saying, oh, they resisted. What do you expect? And I'm talking about vegans. And I'm thinking, okay, if it was, say it was a pit bull and the pit bull bit somebody and the police officer shot the dog for biting them, you would be enraged and say, oh my God, why would you shoot? He's a pit bull. He was scared. That's why he, he bit you. He, he, he didn't know any better. He was abused. He thought, and it's like, we have to extend that same level of understanding to human beings. Yes. Because we don't have to explain these things when it comes to animals. Everyone gets it. But when it comes to humans, for some reason, human beings are still and and black people are still not considered, you know, don't don't still get that same consideration. And I want people to understand resistance does not deserve death. If you resist, you don't deserve to have your whole life removed from the planet. Mm. So I want people to change that programming and thinking that if a person ran, they should die. If a person fought back, they should die. If a person talked back, they should die. That we got to get out of that programming because what that's going to end up creating is a police state to where everyone has to be obedient. And guess what? That's not going to just be with black people. That's going to pass on to everybody. 
And so we have to really look at what it is that we're promoting and what type of future that that's going to create. So I just want vegans, uh, white vegans to just think and dig a little bit deeper when it comes to some of the things that they're contributing to. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to the misanthropy, the hating of humans, it's interesting. I'd never, you said something that I've never really thought of. And that's if a white person says, I hate humans, it kind of means something different to a black person or it yeah. can feel different because yeah. of our history. And I've, I had never, I've never considered that, never thought of that. You know, it breaks my heart. And uh, thank you for pointing that out. And another thing about the misanthropy, you know, I, I get it too. I mean, I totally understand we can be so frustrated and, and unhappy with our own species and what we've done to this planet, but expressing those views publicly, it not only turns off vegans, it certainly turns off non-vegans. I mean, yes. you know, they, they, people love people. They love their families. They love their children. They don't get it when, you know, because they haven't come to the realizations of the horrible things that humans have done. So yeah. those expressing those views publicly doesn't help animals or anyone. No, it yeah. doesn't. It doesn't. Because how are you going to save the world if you hate your own species? Yeah. And, and these animals, because I hear people all the time say, oh, the world, the world would be better if we weren't on it. But it's like, well, too late. We've domesticated <laughs> some of these animals. They need us. Yeah. So we got to stay here, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 So I'd love to kind of switch gears a little bit. And I know that you are a person of faith as am I. And you talked a little about your spiritual connections in the beginning of the interview. Did you, I'm just curious if you grew up in a religious household, what's, what's your religious background and what's your spiritual identity and, and connection to spirituality now? So I did not grow up in a religious household at all. My mom left that up to me and uh, my stepfather at the time, he was actually atheist. And I mean like hardcore atheist, <laughs> but I had cousins and on the weekends and sometimes the entire summers I would spend with them and they were the complete opposite. They were like Baptist church, holy rolling, cartwheels in the aisles, <laughs> shouting, organs, <laughs> music, preacher, sweating and talking heavy, like... <laughs> It was two different worlds that I lived in. Yeah. <laughs> and so honestly, I actually kind of grew up a little bit resentful of like church because so many things I saw behind the scenes. And then uh, in my 30s, I ended up converting to Christianity for about five years. I had like a really interesting spiritual experience and I decided I wanted to start going to church. And I did that for about five years. And then I started having these like awakenings and they got deeper and deeper. And then I realized I really didn't need to identify with anything. So for me, I don't identify with anything um, because my beliefs are constantly evolving and changing for the better. So for me, I just, I'm just constantly seeking to broaden and increase and expand my awareness that's what I focus on like I want to have awareness of the world that I live in awareness of my behavior awareness of reality um, awareness of the illusions that we participate in and how we keep these systems going and even being careful of how I judge the people that are running this planet you know if I had that type of power I don't know what type of person I would be <laughs> so it's like I'm constantly you know trying to make sure that I check in with myself and keep myself in check, but also to allow myself to be a person because that's the whole reason I feel like we're here is to have the human experience and to have the contrast and to have the ups and to have the downs and to be the villain and to be the hero and to be the participator and the observer and the victim. Like it's all allowed but it's, you know, what role do you want to play? So, you know, right now the role that I want to play is I want to help restore heaven on earth. I'd like to have that experience. So I'm just constantly deciding how I want to show up 
on this planet every day. And that's an interesting game. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, and I, I, I believe very deeply that veganism can be, and can be con- seen to be connected to a spiritual path uh, because in all religions, there's a common thread of compassion and compassion for your neighbor or uh, your fellow humans, your fellow beings. Uh, and, you know, of course, we feel that that extends to the animals and the planet. And a lot of religions have that within their doctrine. So, yeah, so I, 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 uh, I love that uh, when spiritual people are, are bringing in that vegan element and vice versa, uh, I think that they, they work well together. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think that's, that's why I love Compassion Consortium because that's, to me, there, that, that element is kind of missing somewhat from the general. Yeah, ex- explain what that is. Tell us, tell us about that. This is a new kind of vegan church, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a new vegan church created by uh, Victoria Moran. And I'm really excited to be a part of it. And it's, I, what my hopes for this community is that vegans, more vegans will participate and come and sneak their head in and, and see what it's all about, because it's the one element that I think um, we lack a lot, even though we talk compassion a lot, but often our compassion um, is conditional and it's strictly for one species. <laughs> and um, I'm hoping that this really, really takes off because it's, it's one of those things. And, you know, the compassion consortium is, is really new, but it's one of those situations where a person can come in and like when I was attended, you know, it, I was kind of uh, dealing with the whole Chauvin trial. And then there was something else that happened with the police situation in Ohio. And so my heart was kind of heavy. And when I attended, like it softened me back up again because I listened to people talking and everyone was just really gentle and and loving and using really kind words. And it gave me a nice reset. We're dealing with as vegans and animal rights activists, we're really trying to stop people from eating dead bodies. So this is a little bit of a horror show. And so it can really affect the heart, the mind, Um, You know, a lot of us deal with depression. So many people deal with like anxiety. A lot of us overwork ourselves because we feel like there's, you know, we can't do enough. And so we really need something, a lot of different things, but we really need something to kind of remind us that it's okay to feel and to be gentle with ourselves. And I really think this is what, you know, the Compassion Consortium is really for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. It's and just to clarify for people who don't know, it's a new gathering. Uh, I think it's the last Sunday or last. I'll put a link in the show notes uh, to it so we can so you can look at the details. But it's it's once a month. It's a gathering online that is kind of like vegan, animal friendly church but non-denominational and, and open to everyone and spiritual, spiritual, but not religious and, and all of that. And I think bringing anyone with a spiritual leaning together that, so they feel in a, in a safe space being vegan, because sometimes your spiritual connection to your church or your temple or your synagogue or whatever it is, is, is not animal friendly or vegan friendly in any kind yeah. of way. Yes. Yeah. So this is a place where we can have that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I'm hoping that it causes a shift in the vegan community and um, people start to attend regularly. Yeah, that would be great. I'll, I'll definitely put uh, a link to the information on that in the show notes, the Compassion Consortium. So Gwenna, what projects are you currently working on? So I'm working on a very fun project right now. I'm in the midst of creating a nonprofit called the Planetary Awakening Project. And it's going to have different elements to it. But the one that I'm focusing on right now is uh, an animation. 
series. Mm -hmm. And so the animation series is going to be like the story that I told er earlier in the conversation about me having the connection with the cow. I'm going to get that story animated. (gasps) So so cool. I love it. So I'm going to have like animations between one to three minutes of different stories. So not just I'm going to start with mine, but it's going to be different people that have like really unique stories on how they went vegan and you know what they're doing now because there's something about like watching a video and hearing people talk that kind of like penetrates and hits a little bit differently so this is something I'm hoping will like reach non-vegans and will really you know help be a new a different form of like activism so that's what I'm hoping to do with the animation series That sounds wonderful. Yeah, we need all kinds of different creative ways of reaching out. It's so important to have all different kinds of outreach and mediums and art and, you know, everything because because what doesn't resonate with someone may resonate with someone else. And I love that idea of having the animation uh, of different uh, experiences and visions. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm working on, um, I just uh, hired an animator. So hopefully it'll be done in the next 10 days and I can't wait to yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Well, we will be looking for that. So Gwenna, I ask most all my guests this, and I want to ask you, what gives you hope for the future? I just naturally have a natural optimism for the future. I guess I'll say humans do. Humans give me hope because even though, like I said, I understand our human hating brothers and sisters, but <laughs> <laughs> but also at the same time, humans are like, we are such an amazing species. You know, as easy as we can damage the planet, we can also help heal it. Yeah. And I see so many people doing the work. I just recently did a completed a um, climate change uh, certification course. And I was so inspired by the amount of people that were like the work that they're doing and people, you know, want to make sure the oceans are clean, make sure the the drinking water is, is pure, making sure the beaches are clean, making sure there's so many people out here that really, truly, deeply care about the world. And so when I see those type of people, I'm like, okay, I'm not alone, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. oh. And so I just have to focus, you know, not just on the problems, but on the solutions and, and hang out with people that are into seeing through the solutions. So that's what gives me hope is just, you know, there's so many people out here already doing the work and committed to it. Oh, well, Gwenna, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. You are so inspiring in all that you're doing. And uh, it's just such needed and wonderful work. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. And thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. You did a great job with these questions. Oh, good. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) All right. You take care, Gwenna. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Please look up Gwenna's work and support her in any way you can. And help us to reach more listeners by giving us a good rating and writing a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. I really appreciate that. Remember that the animals are counting on us to be courageous, be genuine, be in line with our ethics, and live vegan.